and uh, be able to uh, give you uh, this 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 presentation. Even though the times are not really the ideal, I wish I, we could have met in person and interact uh, a little more. But um, so like um, so, this the title uh, of the presentation. So what I'm going to do is give you a, a little overview of the microbiome in general, and then we'll dive more into what the vaginal microbiome is, and um, then we'll we'll go on into how it's 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 playing a role um, into uh, women's health uh, and also in disease such as sexually transmitted infection. So. What is the microbiome? The microbiome, I mean, I'm sure you've, you've all heard about it. Uh, it's not only in the scientific press, um, but it's also in, it's becoming a, a lot more popularized and it, you can see it in, in, uh, in the popular press. You can see it in you know, New York Times uh, and there's just tons of books being uh, talked about. But you know, it's still a, a little unclear as to what, what, it, what it represents. So, this, the real scientific definition, if you want, of the microbiome is that it encompasses all the microbes that are um, uh, uh, present in or on a, a, a tissue, an organism. It could be uh, an animal, it could be a human, it could be uh, soil, it could be uh, water, anything. And it's the microbes, their gene, their genome, and what they make as well. That's what constitutes the, the whole microbiome, okay? And when we, when we say microbe, we don't just mean bacteria, even though that's what we mostly study because that's what often what's the most abundant uh, as part of a, a microbiome. But that's also uh, uh, the archaea, which are a non more ancient form of, of bacteria, but also fungi, small eukaryotes like parasites and so on, as well as viruses. Okay, so all this uh, represent the microbiome. And the, the microbiome is not really something that's actually very new. Um, if, you, if you remember microbiology class, uh, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek um, was, uh, is being taught, you know, we, we, we learn about him, and he was really the first one to actually observe uh, a microbiome, what he called, you know, a body teeming with uh, uh, microbial life. And so he developed this, this weird little instrument, which is actually a microscope. And he looked at uh, things like this uh, plaque and he described this kind of things, a lot of different shapes and things that moves and he called them animaculis, okay? And he saw so much of those that uh, he really felt like all this was, was all alive. So he was really the first one to be able to, to observe the microbiome, even though he was kind of in a condition that was more a, a disease, but he observed it. Um, way back in, uh, in the late 1600s. So the microbiome is not new to science. But the most of the way we've had to study the microbiome has mostly been through um, basically doing microbiology and cultivation. And in, in this field, there's a, a big anomaly, and we call it the great plate count anomaly, which basically means that when we try to cultivate microbes from an environment, and it could be um, you know, like I said, soil, water, whatever, it could be the intestine, it could be anything else uh, we can think of. When we try to cultivate microbes, we really never capture the, the magnitude that we see when we use microscope, microscopic observation. So basically, we never, we only cultivate a very small minority of what actually is present in, in a sample, any kind of, uh, of sample. So what, what's been developed is mostly now uh, more molecular methods that rely on nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, uh, that allows you to really start looking at um, the, the, the microbes that lives in, in any kind of environment in a much more comprehensive way. And so now we have all those methods and um, we've been able to gut microbiome that's uh, is kind of a, a good one could actually benefit 
uh, um, and, and lead to less severe response to COVID-19. So this, this, the microbiome could be responsible for a lot of aspects of our being. So really what, it, what this all means is that microbes are very important to our biology. And if we want to understand our own biology, we need to understand our microbial partner. So obviously we need to understand our own human cell biology, as well as those of our microbiome, microbial partner. So if you think about a, a human genome, a human genome, we all carry about 23,000 genes. They have the estimate changed by a few hundreds there and then, but it's about 23,000 genes. But if you think about all the genes that the microbes can, can have when you put them all together, we're looking at more than a million genes. In the gut right now, we have a catalog of over 23 million genes uh, 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 being uh, described. So the genetic diversity that is provided by the human microbiome is much greater than the diversity that exists between people in, uh, in the human genome. So if you think about, we share 99% of our, of our DNA. We all human, okay? 99%, maybe even more, okay? When we look at our bacteria only between human, we only share about 10%. That means that each individual is uh, unique when it comes to uh, its own bacteria is more unique than what we are uh, different from uh, by our, our human DNA. And so this came up to the concept of what we call supraorganism, which means it's, we are a supraorganism. That means we are an organism that's composed of human gene, but also microbial gene, okay? So how do we study those, those microbes, the human microbiome? So there's many different ways to study it, but the most popular way um, is, is called metataxonomic, okay? And metataxonomic is, uh, is a method that allows you to answer a very simple question. Who is there, okay? It's gonna define what we call the microbiota, which is basically a, a, a composition of, basically a list of names of all the microbes that are present in a sample and their relative abundance. So you can have 20% of one bacteria, 10% of another, and so on. And so how do we do this? To do this, we rely on, on the sequencing of what we call a marker gene. So a marker gene is a gene that's present in all, basically, bacteria or archaea or eukaryote. Not all at the same time, but they, at least in all of those different um, uh, family. Okay? And uh, by doing this, we're going to survey the composition and the abundance of this microbe. And in, in bacteria, the most um, uh, important gene that uh, is a good marker gene is the 16S ribosome RNA gene. And in eukaryotes, including human, it's going to be the 18S ribosome RNA gene. So what is that gene? The, the gene is uh, codes for ribosomal RNA, okay? And we know that the ribosome, uh, which is the, 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 the a set of both protein and, uh, and RNA, okay? The ribosome is used to read RNA to make protein in the body. And every organism has ribosomes, okay? But those RNA, they're structural RNA. They don't encode for any protein. They're just uh, there to support the structure of that, uh, of that ribosome. And the 16S ribosomal RNA is one of those, and it belongs to the small subunit of that ribosome. And it's present in bacteria and archaea. Not in, in human, it's the 18S. You also have a small subunit of the ribosome, but the, 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 the structural RNA is the 18S. So the, what's very interesting about that gene is that it's, it, it has regions that are highly conserved across all bacteria or archaea and regions that are very variable. I'll show you a, a quick picture. And you can see some of uh, the structure that it has when it's in, uh, in its 2D form uh, uh, and it binds to, to, the, to the ribosome. The advantage of this is that we can use a method that's called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, by designing primer that, are, uh, that bind to the, the conserved region that allows you to amplify those variable regions. And when you get the sequence of that gene, it's, if you want, I like to call it, it's like a bacterial ID. If you know the sequence of the gene, every bacteria has a unique sequence. So if you think about E. coli, it has a sequence that's very unique. So if you know the sequence of the gene, 
you'll be able to compare it to the database and say, oh, that's an E. coli gene. That means if I have that gene, that means I have E. coli, okay? So it's like a bacterial ID. So this is kind of like how the gene is, uh, uh, you know, in a schematic is made. In blue is the region that are conserved. In pink is the region that are uh, variable. So we want to know which one are variable. So we want to know the sequence. So we design primers that binds to the conserved region and we amplify the region that's in middle. And that's the region that's the vectoral ID, okay? And we can do this now in, in a very high throughput manner. So we can actually do those, those amplification in uh, uh, individual sample, but each sample gets a, a, a barcode attached to it. And that barcode is a, a, a piece of DNA, which the sequence is specific, okay? So when we, we sequence all, we amplify all those samples together, like literally hundreds, sometimes thousands, and each one has a, a, this unique barcode. So we can mix them up all together, and then we sequence all this, and then we look for that sequence that's unique to each sample, and then we say, oh, this sequence is for sample one, this sequence is sample two, and so on. And we start binning all the sequence by their barcode, okay? And then we take all the sequences and we compare them to databases, and then we get ultimately the composition. So for example, if you sequence, let's say 10,000 sequence of one sample, and 2,000 of those sequence, um, their sequence match to E. coli again, then that means the sample, 2,000 over 10,000, that means 20% of the sample is made of E. coli. And so if you know, the name of all the, the rest of the sequence, you get a very nice uh, composition of the microbiota. It's very high throughput and it's, it's now a very standard method uh, in the field to study the, the microbiome. So now, you know about the microbiome, you know how we, we kind of study it, let's transition to the vaginal microbiome, which is uh, what I study uh, in my laboratory. So, the vaginal microbiome is, is a very interesting microbiome because um, um, in, in women, when, it's, um, when a woman has an, what I call optimal microbiota, basically you almost see only one species of bacteria, and that species is lactobacillus. And it's very different than the gut bacteria, the gut microbiome, because in a gut microbiome, we see hundreds of different bacteria. In a vagina, when it's healthy, the more in a gut the, it's healthy, the more bacteria you have, the better. In a vagina, it's the total opposite. The less bacteria you have, it has to be lactobacillus, the more optimal it is. As soon as you're gonna start gaining a lot of other bacteria, and I'll show you, then it's not, it's not, it's what we call non-optimal. So lactobacillus is, uh, is belong to what we call lactic acid uh, bacteria. That means it produces lactic acid. Lactic acid is a very good acidifier, which allows to acidify the vagina at less than four. So that's a very acidic environment. So whatever says acidic environment, it really means that it's gonna be restricting the growth of all their bacteria. So having lactobacillus create an environment that's really beneficial for lactobacillus and not for any other bacteria. And one thing that's also very interesting about the vaginal microbiota is that it changes all throughout a woman's life, lifetime, okay? At birth, it, you get the, your mom's bacteria for about four weeks, and I'll explain this in a minute. And then you're gonna, uh, 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 you're, gonna, you're gonna evolve over time, and all this is gonna be driven by one molecule. And I'll, I'll mention this in, in a minute. So this is, if you want, uh, a woman's lifespan. It starts at birth, you have a period where you're uh, uh, pre-menarche, uh, uh, you have uh, menarche, and then you enter the reproductive years, which is usually the longest period, um, anywhere between 12 years old all the way to 48 or so, for depend on women, they for past 50. And then you have menopause, okay? And we know that if a woman, uh, a mom has lactobacillus in her vagina when the baby's born, if it's the baby's born vaginally, if it's a baby girl, that, that baby girl is gonna be transferred those lactobacillus, okay? And we find lactobacillus in the vagina of baby girl. Why do we find lactobacillus? And that's very interesting. One molecule that's extremely important in driving the presence of lactobacillus is estrogen. So if you think of, about uh, 
the vaginal epithelium, okay? So here's the bottom layers of the epithelium and here's the top layers. So they, the epithelium is squamous. That means it has multi-layers and uh, the, the cell at the bottom are immature. And as they grow, they mature, they become uh, stratified. That means they elongate sideways and then they even shed, okay? So estrogen is very important for this maturation of that epithelium. And one thing that's very important when this epithelium maturates like this is that it starts accumulating molecule of glycogen uh, in its upper layer. And that glycogen is essential for the, 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 the maintenance of lactobacillus because the cell can shed, glycogen can be released, that glycogen can be broken down into smaller sugar, and those sugar are essential for the growth of lactobacillus. You can see here in green is lactobacillus. If you don't have that glycogen, you tend to lose lactobacillus, okay? So the one molecule that's extremely important is estrogen. So why do baby girl have uh, uh, lactobacillus at birth? So sure, it's transferred, but it lasts for about three to four weeks. It's because during gestation, uh, moms is sharing blood with baby and pregnancy is, is kind of a hyperestrogenic state. That means there's a lot of estrogen in a baby girl's blood. That means enough estrogen. That means a very mature epithelium, uh, vaginal epithelium. That means uh, glycogen is present and lactobacillus as well. But that estrogen is gonna be used up and because a baby girl obviously is not producing herself estrogen and it's gonna go away um, uh, uh, around three to four weeks. And then we have the premenarche, where you have basically no lactobacillus, detectable in high abundance. And you tend to have a lot of bacteria at that stage that are like anaerobes that are present. And it's a lot more diverse environment, but it's, it's anaerobe. Then you, you enter menarche and you produce, baby, the, uh, uh, a girl is gonna start pr producing estrogen and lactobacillus is gonna come back. So you're gonna have lactobacillus that are gonna increase throughout menarche as estrogen is being produced. And then we have the reproductive years, including pregnancy, where you have this kind of hyperestrogenic um, state, and lactobacillus is actually almost exclusively abundant uh, during, uh, during, just, during uh, pregnancy. And then the rest of the year, you have estrogen cycling, and you always have lactobacillus if it's present. Then in menopause, we start losing estrogen, and we start losing lactobacillus, and we end up with a, a microbiome, a vaginal microbiome that tend to, and I'll show you some, some data on this, that tend to be um, less dominated by lactobacillus and more um, a, a set of anaerobes as well, but that's different than what you see when you see uh, in a premenarche uh, time, okay? So lactobacillus, Let, let's, let's dive in a little bit more in lactobacillus. So it's a, it's a gram-positive bacteria. It's, a, it's an anaerobic or macroaerophilic. That means it can grow with a little bit of, of oxygen, but mostly likes without. Uh, it's rod-shaped bacteria. So it looks like this when you, this is an electron micrograph. And this is a, a, a picture of a vaginal smear. Here you have a vaginal epithelial cells that have shed. And in black here is lactobacillus attached to those uh, epithelial cells, okay? And you can see them in here. There's little uh, rod um, that are present like this. And so lactobacillus, I mentioned, uh, it can take, um, uh, sh it use sugar to make pyruvate and pyruvate is converted to lactic acid by an enzyme that's called lactate dehydrogenase. And very interestingly, it can make both D and L-lactate, which are the two isomer of, uh, of lactic acid. And this is done by two separate enzymes. So for making both, both uh, D and L-lactic acid, you need to have those two enzymes. And I'll show you some data. Not all lactobacillus are able to actually do that. So there's four species of lactobacillus that are very uh, much, um, are often present in the vagina. is lactobacillus crispatus, lactobacillus sinners, lactobacillus gasseri, and lactobacillus gentoni. This is what they look like uh, on the electron micrograph. They're not quite, uh, they don't look the same. Lactobacillus inners tend to have very small rod, while Lactobacillus crispatus tend to have much longer uh, rod. And you can see by just simple gram stain, uh, you can actually almost detect them uh, and recognize them um, on just a gram stain of a, of a vaginal smear. So 
when we started this work, we were the first one to, to use molecular method to look at the composition of the vagina. And I'm, I'm going to show you uh, this data. So we did a, a study that we published back in 2011. And we, had, uh, we enrolled 400 women in that study. So that was at the time was a kind of a, a quite a large study. Uh, all those ones were asymptomatic. And very interestingly, they represented equally four different ethnic groups. And I'll, I'll show you some data. So this is what, when we characterize the microbiota using the method that metataxonomic methods based on the sequencing of the 16S RNA gene I, I told you about, this is what we get. So each vertical line represents one woman, okay? And the abundance of each of those bacteria that are listed here is shown by a color with red, meaning that it's close to 100%. And yellow means close to zero uh, percent, and the shade in in a bit in between uh, uh, represent different abundance. So what you can see is that they were you can cluster every single one of those microbiota, and you find that there are women that tend to have, for example, Lactobacillus gasseri being their dominant Lactobacillus, or you have women that have Lactobacillus inners, or you have women that have Lactobacillus crispatus, or those that are Lactobacillus gensoni. So we could group. The, uh, uh, each microbiota into uh, uh, a group that we call uh, community state type, okay? And we define five community state type. So four of those are, are defined by a very high abundance of one of the four lactobacillus that I mentioned. But the fifth one, which was very interesting, had a very um, low abundance of lactobacillus, and it had a lot of different anaerobes. Uh, and those, remember, they were asymptomatic women. So that means there was five group, and the fifth one, it just didn't have lactobacillus, and it had a higher diversity. So a lot of different bacteria. That's what diversity is, okay? And you can actually take this data, which is here in a kind of a 2D representation, you can put that in 3D space. And in 3D space, each ball here represent a woman, and you can see that some women cluster together at the vertices of this tetrahedron shape. And those are the women that have close to 100% of CST1, which is Lactobacillus crispatus, three is inners, two is gasseri, and five is gensoni. And in the middle, you have those that don't have Lactobacillus, okay? But one thing that we'll answer later is, um, what does it mean when you're here? In the middle between Lactobacillus crispatus, Lactobacillus inners, it, does this mean this woman is always in that state where you have about 50% Lactobacillus crispatus, 50% Lactobacillus inners, or is it a transition state where uh, those women that are on this on this axis here are basically either transitioning from one or to the other community state type? And I'll show you some data to, and I'm not going to answer this question right now. So I mentioned to you that we had four different ethnic groups represented here. And that gave us the opportunity to look, if you want, at the distribution or the frequency of those community state type in each of those different ethnic groups. And that was very interesting data. This was very surprising. Um, what we found is that actually the distribution, the frequency of those different community state type differ very statistically uh, significant by a uh, different ethnic group. And what we find is that in black women and in Hispanic women, about 40% of them have a, have a microbiota that doesn't have lactobacillus, okay? While in white women, it's only 10%, and in Asian women, it's 20%. And the same thing was that lactobacillus inners, community state type three, it's 30, 36%, and it's uh, less but equal in Asian women. Most uh, Caucasian women had a community state type dominated by uh, lactobacillus, number one, okay? But by lactobacillus crispatus is the most uh, uh, dominant, most prevalent uh, lactobacillus that is found in white women. And so we'll talk about what it means to have community state type four uh, in, a, in a little while. So we've expanded over the years uh, what it means, uh, those different type of community state type. And um, now we have actually 13 different community state type. We're able to, if you want, refine um, uh, the different type uh, by using a very large uh, uh, data set where we characterize the microbiota of about 13,000 women. Um, and we, that's allowed us to expand the classification. So we started with our five community state type and we can split them 
and you can go all the way to uh, to those 13 type where you can split each one of those, especially that most diverse type, community type four, you can see it's now uh, split into uh, uh, basically seven different, uh, six different type. No, seven, sorry. Okay, so this is important because the, the next set of data that I'm gonna show you uh, deals with uh, the vaginal microbiota in menopause. I always get asked about those period because uh, we tend to focus on, on reproductive age women when you have estrogen, but what happened when you don't have estrogen in menopause? And those, uh, those oops, sorry, those community state type are very important in, in menopause as I'm gonna show you. So we did a study um, that's called um, uh, the study of women across the nation, SWAN. And uh, this is a, a study that I've been following uh, a, a very large set of women uh, since they were 40. And the study has been going on for about 25 years. And in this last five years, uh, we basically, for the first time in that study, uh, we actually collected a vaginal sample from those women. And we were able to characterize uh, with uh, a very good sample size, uh, the composition of the vaginal microbiota in postmenopausal women. So this is truly postmenopausal women. All the women were 65 years or older. And so what you can see here, uh, I'm comparing women who are uh, reproductive age, so premenopausal in blue, and in postmenopausal in orange. And what you can see is that um, almost for all the category, uh, community type one, which is lactobacillus crispatus, gasseri, inners, uh, you can see that um, uh, women in menopause are, have a lot less than women um, uh, pre-menopause, okay? However, when it comes to community state types 4C, we have, that's where most menopausal women actually, uh, uh, the microbiota uh, belongs to. And it's, uh, it's actually quite rare in, in premenopausal women. So let's, let's expand a little bit what it means to be 4C. So remember I told you we have 13 types, so you can actually split it. And you can see that most women actually belong to that C01 or C1, which is dominated by streptococcus, interestingly. And 4C0 is still a, a very diverse microbiota that often uh, carries a, a species of Prevatola, for example. That's another species that's an anaerobe that's actually thrive in the vaginal environment. So we had um, also a lot of ethnic information on, on, on those women. And so this was the, the ethnic distribution of the, of the court. Most of them were actually Caucasian, but we had Chinese women, we had Japanese women, we had Hispanic women, and, and as well as black women. And so that gave us the opportunity to look at basically the same thing that I mentioned earlier in reproductive age women, which is the distribution of those different community type in each one of those ethnicities. And what you can see is that that varies again. So um, Chinese women, tend to have a lot more community type four than, than others. And what was actually surprising, and it's still statistically significant, is that if you look at community type that are dominate, that have lactobacillus, so five, three, two, and one here, um, black women were the one who had the most, which is extremely surprising because in reproductive age, I told you that black women were the one who had the most community that were lacking lactobacillus. But in menopause, it's almost like they become the one who have the most lactobacillus. Because all the other ethnicity actually are losing lactobacillus. But in black women, it appears that it's not happening. So this is a very uh, in in interesting finding. And you can see that uh, you now if you just take uh, those, that, those orange bar and you just uh, put them here, you can see that um, um, uh, Chinese women, Caucasian women, what they have is most uh, 4C, but black women split almost equally between 4C and 4B. So they, they have uh, also um, uh, a community type that are, even though they don't have lactobacillus, they're slightly different than, than the others. So the, the microbiota in, in menopause is really characterized by this lack of, of, of lactobacillus and uh, an overabundance of that uh, community state type 4C, uh, which doesn't have uh, the, the, the pathogen that we know are associated with community state type 4 in, um, in reproductive age women, which I'll, I'll explain in, in, in a minute. So 
I remember I told you about those dots that were in the middle and answering the question if those dots were transitioned from one state to another or if they were the way women's wear uh, at all times. So we tried to answer that question as well. And so we explored the, the, the dynamic of the vaginal microbiota. So we looked at 160 women and those ones were amazing participants in our study. They collected themselves daily sample at home for 10 weeks. So it's a 70 sample uh, over a 10 week period. And we had only uh, two women of the whole, uh, throughout the whole study that actually stopped um, uh, uh, in the study. They also collected uh, daily diaries. So it was very much, they were very much involved uh, in, in the study. And then we characterized the microbiota using the same method that I mentioned earlier. So now, instead of having one snapshot in time, we're going to have the composition of the microbiota over time and what it looks like. So when you do this, you see several types of profile. The first type, which is very interesting, is women who are basically dominated by lactobacillus. So in, in green here is lactobacillus gasseri, in red is lactobacillus crispatus, orange is inners, and in brown is lactobacillus gensmi. What you can see is that almost at all time, they have close to 100% lactobacillus, one of those four. The only time where they, they lose that, that dominance is during menses. So during menses, the microbiota is changing. It makes a lot of sense from an ecological perspective because the environment is changing. You have more oxygen, you have a different physical environment, different biochemical environment, and microbes are gonna adapt to that very quickly. And you can see a uh, different a set of anaerobes that are gonna uh, start growing, uh, anaerobes and aerobes that start growing during menses. Uh, the effect of menses is different on every woman. So for example, this particular woman, you can see that menses had very little effect on the composition. Uh, same thing here, it's a smaller effect. Streptococcus is the species that show up during menses. Here, Streptococcus doesn't exist. It's Lactobacillus inners that shows up during menses. But you can see as soon as menses is over, the microbiota just snapped back in place like it was uh, prior. So this is almost like the optimal microbiota. And you can see that the effect of menses is different, that even within uh, a background that is dominated by Lactobacillus crispatus here, you can see that the response it could be, is very personalized, but still menses has an effect on the microbiota. And then you have uh, women that here tend to be uh, uh, respond to menses as well. Here, here they have also respond to spotting. So this woman was, was spotting throughout her menstruation, throughout the menstrual cycle. And you can see that uh, each time the microbiota was responding. And here we have a woman who has all four species of lactobacillus. So in black is, is gentanae, green is gasseri, orange is inners, and in red is, uh, is lactobacillus crispatus. But all those four species are almost in an equilibrium uh, throughout uh, the time. And you can see menstrual cycle also constitute a disruption as well in, in those more. But what was most surprising is the, those patterns. And in those patterns, especially if you look at the first two, uh, basically you don't even see lactobacillus. I always thought that when we looked at this cross-sectional data, those snapshot in time, that those women that were in that community state type four that was something that would be temporary, something that you just happened to catch because at the time we sampled, it was just you know a time where they ended up in that state. But what we found is that those ones tend to actually be in that state where they don't have lactobacillus for at least those 10 weeks period where they were sampled. You can still see the effect of menses, but those ones have a lot of different anaerobes and they have anaerobes that are even associated with uh, disease such as bacterial vaginosis, which we'll talk a little bit, like Atopobium vaginae and Garnola vaginalis. Okay, here it's, it's Garnola vaginalis as well. And you have very little lactobacillus. And this woman, it's the same thing. You have some lactobacillus, but it's, it's never dominant. And here you have a woman, the fourth one here, that actually gets treated with antibiotic, uh, metronidazole. And what you can see, it gets rid of all the anaerobes. That's what metronidazole does. And you can see that the trickling of lactobacillus inners that was present prior to antibiotic, now, because they're not sensitive to metronidazole, it becomes the dominant species. But this is often short-lived. This is uh, 
a, a, a big problem in, 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 uh, in this field is that you treat with antibiotic, you can resolve if the woman had symptoms, but then three or four weeks later, or sometimes even before that, the, the microbiota start to come back to what it was prior to, uh, to treatment. And then you had women where basically the patterns were very erratic. Uh, here you can see that Lactobacillus crispatus and inners are constantly almost ecologically fighting for dominance, but they can never actually achieve dominance. And uh, it's the same thing here. A lot of different species that are constantly um, basically fighting and or even being together, but there's no, no consistency into the pattern that, that, that you can see. So we tried to model you know, the driver of that, of stability in the microbiota. We, we'd like to know this. And so one of the main driver is actually time in a menstrual cycle. So what you can see here is a curve here that tells you the rate of change of the microbiota. So how much does the microbiota is changing from one day to another and the amplitude at which it changes. So during menses, we know it changes a lot. So that's why the curve is high. But what we find is that during uh, mid-cycle, it's when it's the minimum. That means it's changing the less. And same thing in the, the second, in the half, basically in the, um, the mid uh, second half of the cycle, same thing. And then it comes back and it starts changing again. And it's very interesting because this mimic very nicely, uh, if you want the, the typical uh, changes in estrogen and progesterone level throughout the menstrual cycle. So the more estrogen you have, the more stable you are, and the least estrogen you have, the more unstable you are, okay? So estrogen and progesterone usually works uh, together. So um, now we know that this rate, this change, this stability is affected by time and menstrual cycle. But in this study, we also show that sexual activity had some impact on this stability. But mostly in that community state type three that I mentioned uh, earlier, that's dominated by lactobacillus sinners. And we'll show later that lactobacillus sinners is not the optimal lactobacillus to have. So here, what I'm gonna show you is uh, uh, basically a, a little uh, animation of, uh, to, to make you appreciate how dynamic the microbiota can be. And so as the bar is moving through this profile, the same one that I showed you earlier, you can see that the, this big ball represents where the bar is here. And so here it's dominated by lactobacillus crispatus, as shown here. And then it's lactobacillus inert domination. Then it comes back a little bit. Um, it basically has less lactobacillus, but it comes back towards crispatus. It's going to stay there a little while. And then at the end of this 16-week uh, 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 profile, you can see it's losing lactobacillus, and it ends up into that state where it's uh, uh, that's commute state type 4 that I mentioned earlier. So you can see that it's quite dominant. It's quite dynamic system. And one thing that was very interesting in this study is that when you look at all those profile, you can see that that ball didn't go anywhere. There's almost like restriction as to how far uh, you can deviate from your state. So this one only deviated between crispatus, inerse, and community state type four, but it never went to community state type five or community state type two. So it stayed within that, that uh, specific parameters. And every single one of the, the women that we followed you could see that, that same kind of a, a profile. So we've been very interested in that commute state type four because it seems like it's an important um, uh, commute state type. And I've been calling commute state type four a normal but non-optimal state. And that state that carry risk, okay? So I'm just gonna walk you through the a little thinking behind this. So we know that basically at any given time, we have 25% of all women that don't have lactobacillus, that, that Lactobus doesn't dominate their vaginal microbiota. And we know that state is associated with something we call the Nugent score. And I'm gonna show you uh, what that is, as well as very high pH. And that makes complete sense. If you don't have lactobacillus, you're gonna have a higher pH. So this is basically that same tetrahedron that I showed you, except that this time we mapping Nugent score, and I'm gonna show you what, what that is. So you can see high Nugent score is associated with community state type four, lower Nugent score in green is associated with like presence of lactobacillus. And as well, same thing with pH. Higher pH is in the uh, uh, community state type four, lower pH with uh, lactobacillus. So what is the Nugent score? The Nugent score is, a, is a, basically a, a, a gram stain um, evaluation for uh, diagnosing bacterial vaginosis, okay? 
And you basically have three, uh, uh, three uh, results. One can be normal, where you have a normal score between zero and three. That means you, you look, at, when you do this gram stain, you look for the presence of uh, morphotypes. So just the bacteria and what they look like. So here you can see lactobacillus and only lactobacillus. And here you can start seeing those little tiny rod that looks like what we call Gaunerella or, um, or Mobiluncus, which are the other bacteria that we look for. And if, depending on how much you see and if there's some lactobacillus, you're gonna have an intermediate score. And if you have almost exclusively uh, those rod type and what we call clue cells, which is like an aggregation of all those bacteria, which are not lactobacillus around those epithelial cells. And those clue cells, if they're present, will really shift the score all the way to between seven and 10. And that's a true diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. This is done in a, clinic, in a research setting because uh, nowadays, um, I don't know too many clinicians who actually are doing this, unfortunately. Uh, most of the, the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis is done by the AMSOL criteria, which are clinical evaluation and report of symptoms. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that later uh, by the patient. So if we have that state, we know that community type 4 is associated with high nutrient score and as well as higher pH, okay? So we also know that high nutrient score is strongly associated with increased risk of sexually transmitted infection, including HIV. And we've known this because nutrient score is very easy to do, to do and it's cheap. And we can do it in very large uh, number of people. And so in epidemiology, people have done this. So we've shown that if a woman enters a study and she has a high nutrient score, she's more likely throughout the study acquire a sexually transmitted infection than a woman who have a low nutrient score. So that means women who have a community state type 4, they can be asymptomatic, okay? They could be apparently healthy, but potentially they are at increased risk of uh, sexually transmitted infection and as well as other adverse infection outcomes, especially, for example, pregnancy outcome, if that happened in pregnancy. So let's talk a little bit more about bacterial vaginosis and, and what it is. So VV, um, as it's known, uh, is the most common cause of uh, vaginal symptoms that uh, prompt a woman to go and seek medical uh, evaluation. Uh, the prevalence in the U.S. is about 30 percent. In Africa, it's way above 50 percent. And in Europe, it's anywhere between 9 and 20%, depending on the country uh, you are. Uh, that accounts for about 10 to 15 million doctor visits per year in the U.S. And um, usually women will seek medical ev evaluation because they have symptoms. So um, they will report symptoms such as uh, uh, this thin gray, white uh, vaginal discharge and that odor. Itching and burning also are uh, associated, but usually the discharge and the odor are really almost the best predictor of vaginal, of bacterial vaginosis. It's always been characterized as this kind of broad ecologic disturbance of the vaginal microbiota. Really what it means is not having lactobacillus. So um, what's very interesting is that if you, if you look at bacterial vaginosis, unless, a, a, and you look at women who are not seeking medical evaluation. If, if you just take a broad survey of, of many women, you can find that women that have uh, what we call symptomatic bacterial vaginosis, that means they, 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 they're not reporting those symptoms, but when you do uh, an evaluation, the doctor, um, no, no, symptomatic, they do report those symptoms, but if it's asymptomatic, they don't report those symptoms, but upon medical examination or even microbiologically, they literally have a microbiota that looks like uh, bacterial vaginosis. So usually they don't seek medical uh, evaluation, but they are, their microbiota does not have, uh, uh, that does, is, is still characteristic of bacterial vaginosis. So the intervention to treat BV is really uh, antibiotic, and it's, uh, the, the first one will be metronidazole, clindamycin. There's a new one that's called secnidazole, which is uh, basically you take it only instead of uh, for five or seven days, uh, oral or vaginal administration. Secnidazole is uh, one pill, um, uh, it's two gram, you take it once, and then uh, it, uh, it has a pharmacodynamics that's much longer, so it, it, it stays in the body for much longer, it's more effective. But the problem with, with all those treatments is that, like I mentioned earlier, ultimately, uh, bacterial vaginosis is, is going to come back. And relapse is extremely common in that, in that condition. 
So one of the questions that's always coming up is, so is CST4 truly vector vaginosis? So what I always answer is that vector vaginosis is a type of CST4, but not all CST4 are vector vaginosis. And so if you think about the clinical definition, um, when you have symptoms, um, that's, that's very clear, and that's definitely a CST4 um, uh, from a microbiological standpoint. However, treatment is only recommended when the patient reports symptoms. So asymptomatic, because number one, they don't seek medical event, uh, uh, evaluation. Usually, are, are, even if, they, if the doctor actually had an annual visit or something, might decide there is bacterial vaginosis. If the patient does not report, there's no treatment. That's a CDC guideline. So the microbiological definition of bacterial vaginosis, which is not used in clinical setting, setting, actually aligns very well with the definition of CST4, which is you don't have lactobacillus, you can have gonorrhea or mobiloncus, which is also called BBAB1, which are strict and facultative anaerobes. So now if you think about it, considering that only about half of the women with CST4 actually will report symptoms, okay? That means we're not treating the risk associated with CST4, which are, you know, the STI and everyone. We're only treating the symptom. So we're only treating the symptoms associated with bactovaginosis because as a population, you still have 50% of the women that have the risk, that the risk associated with having a, a microbiota that's like CST4. So what are those, those, those risks? And whether you're symptomatic or asymptomatic for bacterial vaginosis, you have risks such as this. So you can have gynecological, gynecological risk, such as uh, uh, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. I mentioned acquisition of STI that include uh, herpes, HIV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, uh, HPV. Uh, more, there's a lot of morbidity uh, because uh, 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 that, that's associated with, for example, discharge and malodor. In obstetric, there's also a lot of things. Most of them are preterm delivery and low birth weight, but there's a lot of other uh, postpartum and postabortal endometriitis, amniotic fluid infl inflammation, chorioamnionitis, and so on are all associated with, uh, with uh, uh, this uh, bacterial vaginosis, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic. So now the big question is, what should we do clinically? Should we start moving to uh, a, a place where we start treating all community type four. So we can do a microbiological evaluation of the microbiota and start treating. So we've known for a long time that not having lactobacillus is a risk factor, okay, for all those outcomes I just mentioned. But like I said, we only treat symptoms. So we're not addressing this, this uh, major health issue in, in women. And so the, the problem is that effective treatment of symptomatic or asymptomatic bacterial vaginosis, so if we were to treat all CST4, I think if we could have those effective treatment, we could have an, a major impact on wound health, okay? We would reduce STI, we would re reduce, uh, especially in, in, in our, not just in the US, but in, in Africa. But the problem is that to be able to treat all uh, um, basically bacterial vaginosis, symptomatic and asymptomatic, it will require uh, the CDC to change their guidelines. And that's a, that's a big one. That's very difficult to achieve. The second problem is that we don't have very efficacious treatment for BV, let alone for all CST4. So until we have a, a good treatment, we'll be able to actually show if you, if you can treat BV, eliminate recurrence, then you can actually show that even treating asymptomatic actually will benefit um, um, women and reduce the risk of, of STI in general. And because we don't have an efficacious treatment, a lot of those clinical trials uh, have not been successful, whether it's for STI or even for preterm birth. So basically, uh, as, a, as a thing, we know that having, lower, having a, a lot of lactobacillus uh, you have a, a, a lower risk of all those adverse outcomes. And if you don't have lactobacillus and you have some of those bacteria, you tend to have a much elevated risk. So basically, this is still a very, a very good um, uh, paradigm that uh, is still uh, uh, present today, even though we have more molecular method to evaluate uh, the microbiota. So from a dynamic perspective, um, we, we've 
the way I think of it is that there are windows um, of high risk that open and close on a temporal scale. So if you think about a, this line represent the, the ball moving in, the, in, the, in this space, uh, you can think every time a woman is in that sphere in the middle, she's at risk. But there are times where she's not in that sphere. That means she's somewhat protected. Okay, so here, over the, the time course of the study, the woman, this particular uh, woman spent most of the time in that sphere. The risk is high. Here, it's just a little bit of her time. The risk is lower. And here, this woman spent only time in a lactobacillus dominated state, hence the risk is uh, much, much lower. Okay, so one thing that when you think about the risk, you might want to think of it more as the, the frequency in which you go into that state, the CST4, and how long you stay in that state. I think this is a much better evaluation of risk than just one sample and determination of, uh, of the risk based on one, uh, one sample. If you CST4 in that sample, you're at risk. No, I think that if you can include a little more uh, longitudinal profile, that's a lot better. So what are the, the factors that affect the vaginal microbiota? And um, so we know that hygiene practice are a, a major factor. So for example, douching, and we know it's also very more uh, common in certain ethnicity than others, which could contribute to um, uh, the, the presence of community type four. Sexual intercourse is definitely uh, uh, an important factor. We know that uh, 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 some of those microbes that are anaerobes that are associated with, with bacterial vaginosis or community state type four can be found on a, on the partner's penis. So it can be transferred uh, if you have condomless intercourse. Um, the use of lubricant can also be a problem because a lot of those lubricants have very high osmolality and they actually uh, create a lot of problem on the epithelial cells of the vagina. And by more or less not destroying, but uh, arming the harming the, the, the vaginal epithelium, they actually create, they also arm the microbiota that's associated with it. Smoking, we've shown that smoking is actually a major risk for community type four, and that's very important. You can find metabolite of nicotine in, uh, in the vagina. So, uh, and those metabolites can have major negative impact on vaginal lactobacillus. And contraception is also another one. Uh, there are some contraception that tend to favor lactobacillus, like OCPs um, uh, are actually really good. They tend to drive lactobacillus, but if you go to Depoprevera or other long-acting uh, uh, contraceptive, they have the counter effect. They tend to create more CST4 type of microbiota. And the last one is obesity. So there's, it's been known for quite a while that obesity is associated with actually symptomatic vector vaginosis. So in the, the last part, um, I guess uh, I'll have to go too quick. I just want to, to, to bring you up a little bit on how do we think about the microbiota and what are the, the factor in the microbiota that actually increase the risk to sexually transmitted infection. So it's not just good to know that uh, if you have lactobacillus or not, but what are the factors that are actually uh, important in protection and what the mechanism by which the microbiota is protecting against uh, sexually transmitted infection. So we know that uh, vaginal microbiota is definitely the first line of defense against STI. Be before uh, a pathogen can actually see the, the, um, the epithelium where it can infect, it has to see the microbiota. So this is really the first line of defense. So we know that um, when you think about of any kind of infection, there's a lot of uh, data on the estimated rate of transmission after contact. That means the successful infection after you in contact with the pathogen. So I, here I'm showing you data for chlamydia trachomatis, which is the, and I'll show you a little bit about chlamydia, uh, the, the pathogen for chlamydia. Um, usually only 25 to 40% of the infection actually result in a true infection. So you can be exposed to chlamydia, but only 25 to 40% uh, will lead to a true infection. And that, that number is actually much lower for HIV. So what we've been thinking is that uh, there are different types of microbiota that are better at preventing STI than others. Because not all women have the same microbiota, so about 25% to 40% of the case, they'll have a microbiota that's permissive, 
and in others, it will be protected. So what we want to understand is the type of microbiota and what are the, the if you want, the microbiome host functional interaction. So how do those two uh, work in, in, in concert to actually govern that susceptibility or protection to, to STI? So for those who are not very familiar with chlamydia, chlamydia is actually a, a, a very difficult pathogen to study because it's an intracellular pathogen. It, its infectious particle is called elementary body. And that elementary body is going to attach to your to epithelial cells in uh, the vagina or the cervix, sorry. And uh, it, that, that once it attaches, it's going to invaginate inside the cells. And it's going to make what's called an inclusion. And inside that inclusion, it's going to convert to, uh, from an EB, an elementary body, to an RB, a reticulate body. And the reticulate body is the form of chlamydia that can divide. And it's going to divide inside the, the host cell, making a very large inclusion. Once there's too much uh, uh, reticulate body inside that inclusion, they start converting back to a, an elementary body. And then they get so it gets so big that it just bursts the epithelial cells open and it's going to release new elementary bodies that now can continue and infect other cells. Okay? So we've been trying to study the role of the microbiota in preventing this particular infection. So the first thing we did is study women uh, that had chlamydia. And we had 150 women who were chlamydia positive and they were then uh, subsequently treated with azithromycin. And then we resampled them, which is the typical treatment, one gram azithromycin, and then they can go home. And then we resampled them three months later. So this is what the microbiota look like when they, they are actually positive for chlamydia. Most of the women actually have community state type four. Some of those have community state type three, and there was only two in this study that had community state type one and had chlamydia at the time we did the diagnosis, okay? Then when you compare it to a population that never had chlamydia, that's ethnically matched, this is what you see. So there's major differences. Definitely a lot more community state type four when you have chlamydia, but it could be the effect of the infection. So now let's look at those same women three months later once they are clear uh, of the infection. And what you can see is that very interestingly, they have about the same amount of community state type 4 as the control group, but most of them have community state type 3. And that's also statistically significantly different. So one thing that's very interesting here is that we can start thinking about different hypotheses. So obviously, they took azithromycin. So people might say, well, maybe what you see is that the effect of the antibiotic, because antibiotic kill bacteria, so you will drive the microbiota in one direction or another. The other hypothesis is that this, they return to a microbiota that they had prior to, to be infected. So it's a subpopulation of this control population that's basically at risk of that infection. And the risk is carried by this community type 3, which is dominated by lactobacillus inners, and we know that not having lactobacillus is a risk factor. But here, the novel thing is that that would mean that we're saying that lactobacillus enters, a lactobacillus is actually increased the risk to infection. And so we decided to test this hypothesis because that would make a lot of sense. So we tested the antibiotic hypothesis. And definitely we can say that antibiotic contribute to uh, the, the pattern that we see somehow because when you test the resistance to antibiotic to different a strain of those different speed, different bacteria, you can see that strain of Gonorrhea are resistant to azithromycin, have some level of resistance, as well as strain of lactobacillus inners. However, all the other lactobacillus were completely sensitive to azithromycin. So azithromycin could wipe out most lactobacillus and have some lactobacillus inners or Gonorrhea to remain, which means that CST4 or CST3 might actually be uh, what you're driving to. Doxycycline, which is another uh, antibiotic for uh, treating chlamydia, actually was um, uh, uh, all, almost all bacteria were sensitive. There was some low level resistance for lactobacillus and uh, gonorrhea as well, but much, much more sensitive as a, as a whole. 
So the second hypothesis is that inners is actually not protective against chlamydia. And so we also tested that hypothesis. So what you can see here is chlamydia, like I mentioned to you, it makes inclusion, those little um, uh, inclusion inside the cells where you have those reticulate body. And so you can stain for those reticulate body and, and look at them on the microscope and they will appear green. The nucleus of the cells is in blue and you can see those big inclusion that are on those cells. And this is done in a condition where you just have, you grow the cells, you infect them in different culture media and you infect. And so you can view the inclusions. It's perfect infection, it works really well. Now, if you expose the cells to Lactobacillus crispatus or Lactobacillus jensenite, you can see you don't see inclusion, meaning those Lactobacillus protect um, uh, the cells from infection by, by chlamydia. However, Lactobacillus sinners was not very good at doing this. It was still not as, as clean as having nothing, but you can see that compared to Lactobacillus crispatus or Lactobacillus jensenite, you had a lot more infection that, uh, with Lactobacillus sinners. So we tried to figure out why. Why is that like Lactobacillus sinners would be um, um, more, um, less uh, protector, protective for chlamydia? One thing that we, we looked and we found is that Lactobacillus sinners is very interesting, is that if you look at all the different Lactobacillus, they tend to produce both D and L or just D. So Lactobacillus jensenii only produce D and doesn't, oops, doesn't produce L lactate. Um, Lactobacillus crispatus and Lactobacillus gasseri produce both uh, D and L lactic acid. But Lactobacillus sinners only produce L lactic acid. So we decided to test if actually lactic acid, D lactic acid is actually the molecule that could actually contribute to this phenotype. So we measured um, the, the, the production and we, we were able to confirm that crispatus and Jensen I make D lactate, make a little bit of L, but lactobus inners in orange here doesn't make D and makes a lot of L lactic acid. And so what we did, we took this experiment, okay, and we complemented lactobus inners with D lactate or L lactate at pH four. And you can see that when you complement with D, you basically reduce the infection to the level of what Lactobacillus crispatus does. But when you complement with L, which you already had L, so the pH is very low, then you, you actually don't. You, you maintain some uh, level of susceptibility. So it seems like D lactate is, lactic acid is very important. And so what we did here, we wanted to understand if lactic acid was affecting di directly chlamydia or was it affecting the cells? And what we found is that it does not, it affects uh, the, it doesn't affect chlamydia. So what we did, you expose uh, chlamydia to uh, the cell to uh, lactic acid, or you expose chlamydia to lactic acid here. And you can see that you are at pH seven, you have no, no effect whatsoever. But if you go to pH four with D lactate, if you expose the cell only, you, you can see that you have a protection if you expose chlamydia only, that protection is lost. If you expose both, you can recover the protection. And L lactate protect a little bit, but much less than D lactate, okay? So not only it's, it's lactic acid, it doesn't affect chlamydia directly, it affects only the cells directly, but uh, it also does this in a pH dependent manner. So it's not the presence of lactic acid, it's the pH at which it's also present. So you, have, you cannot neutralize lactic acid, you have to keep it at pH four. So the next thing we wanted to know is, we wanted to understand if, if you have uh, those, um, those cell and you expose them to lactic acid first, and then you infect, can you actually protect like this? And how long can you maintain that protection? So what we found is that even 24 hours post exposure, you can still maintain uh, a, a, res a resistance to infection when you're exposed to D lactate or L lactate compared to a control that's just uh, HCL at pH four. So pH itself is not good enough. It has to be lactic acid driven pH. And then you can use this, the same thing with the bacteria. Do you expose the bacteria at up to 24 hours and even to some extent, almost 48 hours, you still protect it. So there's a, a long lasting effect of that exposure on the resistance to chlamydia. What was more interesting is that we did the experiment in reverse. We infected the cells and then we waited 
uh, different time, and then we expose them to lactobacillus or lactic acid. And we ask, can you actually clear the infection? And what we found is that it's actually the case. So if you do this three hours, six hours, 12 hours, or even 24 hour post-infection, you can see that you can start clearing uh, the infection. So um, if you were to let the infection go, this is what you would see. But at three hours you expose and you measure this at you know, 48 hours later, you can see that you have almost no infection as uh, with the D and L lactic acid. And the same thing with lactobacillus. But lactobacillus inners is never good enough to do this. Okay, so lactobacillus inners is definitely, because it doesn't produce D lactate, is not a very optimal lactobacillus. So let's summarize all this. And this is my last slide, so I, I went a little bit over. But um, So we know there are different type of vaginal microbiota, and they differ by the type of lactobacillus or uh, the no, not having lactobacillus, and that leads to different level of protection against infection. We know that the vaginal microbiota is, can be very dynamic. And this, this, this basically very dynamic system is related also to the level of protection that it affords. Okay? So if you stay all the time in lactobacillus, you tend to be very protected. If you keep on moving away from lactobacillus, every time you kind of open the door to, uh, to infection. So it's how often and how long you stay in that no lactobacillus state that, give, that drive that level of protection. We know there's plenty of factors in our regular life that can affect the composition of the microbiota. And those then could potentially be uh, uh, controlled. What we know also is that lactic acid is a very important metabolite. And that lactic acid actually affects host physiology. I didn't show you all this, but uh, we've, we've shown that lactic acid actually affects the, uh, the rate at which the cell divide and by slowing down those cells, they can actually uh, protect against the infection because the cells have to be dividing very heavily, very fast to, to sustain the infection. So we know lactic acid is very important, especially uh, for, for chlamydia. And so what it, what it really highlights is that we really need a new solution. And the fact that we can actually, by adding lactobacillus even post-infection, uh, really it points to a uh, new solution that can be based on, on means to modulate the vaginal microbiota. And if we can modulate it towards dominance of lactobacillus, if we can maintain that dominance, we can really improve uh, women's health, especially uh, in pregnancy, and decrease all those adverse events that are associated with having those non-optimal microbiota uh, that don't have lactobacillus. So with that, um, just want to thank some of the people that um, uh, people that are some of the people that are in my lab that did some of the work. Uh, this is another faculty at the University of Maryland, but at the, the, the dental school, Patrick Bavoil, who's an expert on chlamydia, and I've been collaborating with them for over 10 years. And Rebecca Brotman and Courtney, with the work together. Uh, Rebecca Brotman is an epidemiologist uh, with whom I work because I think that um, uh, when it comes to public health in general and the, the microbiome can play a role, but you have to work with the right people that can actually know how to do those kind of big epidemiological study. And so I've been working with Rebecca also for almost 12 years now, and it's been a, a fantastic relation. So um, now, if you have any question, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Ravel, for that presentation. Uh, I know it's been a very busy time for you, so thank you again for being a part of this medical symposium. Um, we'll now open the floor for some questions. Um, someone already has put in a question in the chat, uh, Mr. Wolf. Um, he asks, are there foods or supplements that help to produce lactobacillus? Okay, so um, by food, I assume you mean um, uh, eating, uh, food eating, not food for bacteria. So there's, there's no known diet um, that would improve um, the maintenance of lactobacillus. However, uh, there are uh, data now that are suggesting that having a healthy gut is associated with uh, the, the, the higher, if you want, prevalence of lactobacillus. So like I mentioned, obesity is associated with not having lactobacillus. And the reverse is true that to be lean and to be healthy, 
tend to be associated with, uh, with uh, the presence of lactobacillus. So while we don't know of any specific food or supplement that you could take, um, we know that actually having an healthy gut could actually favor the presence of lactobacillus. And we believe that it's certainly coming from the fact that an healthy gut actually maintain a healthy immune system, very low inflammation uh, immune system. And this effect is certainly a systemic effect. And so I don't know if you, you've read, but there's a lot of studies on the what we call the gut-brain axis, where having an healthy gut can actually improve brain function or even uh, depression and mood swing and things like this. Um, so it is believed that having an healthy gut can also promote an healthy vagina for the, through some of the same mechanism, which are often driven by the production of uh, small chain fatty acid like uh, butyrate, acetate, and propionate in by the gut bacteria that actually can uh, uh, end up in blood and have systemic effect. And uh, this, those low inflammatory states are very favorable for the presence of, of lactobacillus. So it, while they, there's no specific food, there's a good diet, a good healthy diet, I assume fibers and things like this could actually improve uh, the, 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 the vaginal microbiota. Thank you. Any other questions? You can raise your hand. Any more questions? You can still type it in the chat if you want. Yeah, please. <clears throat> I know it's already been a long, long presentation. <laughs> okay, I'll give one more minute for any additional questions. You can raise your hand. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay. Um, Someone asks, um, any advice for sexual activities? So, um, obviously, so they, um, there are several aspects of, of uh, sexual activities. So, um, especially in, in, in the US, for some reason, there's a, a high use of lubricant. And so the idea is to use lubricant that have very low osmolality. Um, so there's a lot of uh, study on um, coconut oil, for example. It's uh, a more natural lubricant that has lowest molality. And there are some lubricants uh, that are being used. Um, one of them is that, that's on the market. That's the, the best one that we measured uh, osmolality in a lot of them. And um, uh, uh, one of them is called Good Clean Love. And it also has, um, it has one of the lowest osmolality all of, all of them, which is very similar to what we measure actually in vivo. And those actually are, are you know, they're not detrimental to uh, the vaginal microbiota and can, can allow you to maintain, uh, you know, a good healthy microbiota while still um, being able to use lubricant. So that's, and obviously, you know, um, we, we as um, we, in my group, we've been developing and, and uh, kind of ways and so ways to, to mod modulate this microbiota. And so they soon will have um, on the market um, a true solution to be able to actually restore uh, a lactobacillus dominated microbiota. And uh, those are our solution that include not only just the bacteria, but a lot of other um, a component like the food for the bacteria, uh, a way to maintain low pH, a way to, um, uh, to, to maintain a low redox potential in the vagina because it's, 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 it's more, it's what we see in vivo. And we, when you have, for example, this community state type four, you don't have this kind of, of property. So we'd like to restore them to create an environment that's favorable uh, for the growth of lactobacillus and especially the lactobacillus we provide with that, that solution. So manipulation of the microbiota, you know, post-sexual activity could actually become something that's, 
that uh, soon will be will be a, an option as well. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay, well, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact me and I'll send them right over to Dr. Ravel. Um, Dr. Ravel, thank you again for presenting this afternoon. I really appreciate your time. Um, everyone, please, I look forward to seeing you all next week. We'll be hearing from Dr. Matthew Freeman. Dr. Matthew Freeman, we're presenting on COVID-19. If you have any other people, friends, colleagues, or um, neighbors that are, would be interested in this topic, please share the registration link and they can still register before next week. Again, the time will start I, at 10.30. Excuse I, me, I, sorry. I, I totally recommend yes. uh, this talk. I, he's, uh, he's one of the few researchers on campus right now who's uh, working basically 24 seven to find, uh, basically he's testing new drug against uh, 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 COVID-19. So um, he has a, a very high level security lab and he's growing the virus. He's been studying it for years. He's a fantastic speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morell. All right. Well, thank you again. Um, look forward to seeing everyone next week. Take care and be safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you.